The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to today's webinar. My name is Chad Sievers, and um, I'm the project manager for Arkansas Building Effective Services for Trauma. And I'm happy to bring you today's uh, webinar. We, we do these on a monthly basis. So um, our presenter today is Dr. Glenn Messman, and um, he's going to be talking to us about some behavior management. And I'm going to do a couple of housekeeping announcements, and then I'll turn things over to our presenter. Um, so we encourage you to ask questions during the presentation. There's a uh, question feature that's on the right side of your screen. So just type those in and we will um, get to as many questions as we can during today's presentation. Um, and if you're interested in uh, a CEU, just be sure to stick around to the very end. We have a code that is given. So if this is your first time attending web one of our webinars, um, we send a survey out at the very end and you'll be asked to enter this code. Um, so just kind of stick around to the end for more instructions on that. We are recording this webinar. Um, we'll upload it to our YouTube channel. Um, so if there's something you missed or you want to rewatch it, uh, you can at a later date. And <clears throat> as, if this is um, a, a topic uh, that is of interest to you, um, be sure to check out our Facebook page. We often post kind of our relevant trainings, webinars, um, topics on child trauma on our Facebook page. And um, so that's just a good good uh, source to see what's happening in Arkansas. Um, so with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to uh, Dr. Messman. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am excited to be able to talk to you guys today about this topic. So we're going to be talking about behavior management for kids who have experienced trauma. So uh, for those who don't know me, I am a licensed psychologist and I'm an associate professor at UAMS in the Department of Psychiatry. So I do some clinical work as part of my job and I do that at the Child Study Center, which is an outpatient psychiatric clinic for kids zero, so birth through age 18. And we see kids with all sorts of different um, presenting concerns and diagnoses and issues, and we definitely specialize in evidence-based care for kids who've experienced trauma, though. So really happy to be able to talk to you guys about this topic. And when I was thinking a little bit about, like, why, are, why is it important to talk about how to manage behavioral difficulties in kids who've experienced trauma, is I think one of the reasons is that we know from research is that children who've experienced trauma many times have a higher likelihood of exhibiting behavioral concerns. So things such as oppositional behavior, defiance, verbal and physical aggression, um, risk-taking behaviors, um, impulsivity, irritability. And I know just clinically, many times when I see kids have experienced different types of traumatic events, they many times exhibit these concerns. Not all of the kids, but a good number do. So I do think it is important for all of us, particularly those who work with kids um, with the, uh, who have traumatic stress and have um, in their history, histories of traumatic events, it's important to understand behavioral principles and how to apply those to children across the age ranges from early childhood, school age to adolescence. So it's really important for all of us, definitely those who do clinical work to be aware of some of these issues. So first, let's just talk about, let's see here, um, if I can forward my slide, there it is. Okay, uh, there we are, wonderful. Okay, so behavior management. So that's what, largely what we're gonna be talking about today. So what is behavior management? And this is a really good definition, but there's a lot of unpacked here as well. Oops, okay, now I think there's a delay in my slide. So there is a significant delay in the slide. So now it's going forward too many slides and we'll eventually get back to the slide that I was on. Okay, we'll wait here a second. Sorry about that, everyone. Let's see if we can get back to the slide. Okay. Here we are. Okay. Let's hopefully we'll stay on this slide. So behavior management. So like I said, there's a lot to unpack here. So successful management of children and adolescents 
with challenging behaviors, it requires goodness, consistent use of a variety of methods implemented in a coordinated manner. So I highlighted some of those words there. First, consistent. Consistency is the most important thing when we're talking about behavior management of children. But I do find it's actually many times one of the most difficult aspects to know. So we want the same response out of caregivers to be happening every single time, regardless of the type of um, child's behavior it is, regardless of how their mood and their, um, their day that they're having. So we want consistency between the caregivers, but we also want consistency, consistency within a caregiver as well. And we also want to use a variety of methods. So many times when people think behavior management, they think kind of um, banking or timeout or removing privileges. And those are um, some aspects of behavior management, but many people also forget about some of the more kind of positive aspects about building a relationship, learning how to give effective commands, spending time in one-on-one -on -one interactions with their children. So we both have both proactive and reactive strategies. Proactive strategies are those that are things that caregivers do that happen before the child behavior because they're trying to elicit more positive child behavior. We'll talk about the proactive strategies first. And then we'll talk about those reactive strategies. Those are the things that caregivers do after the child's behavior has occurred that will either increase or decrease the likelihood of that behavior occurring again in the future in the same context. So, it, like I said, it's a variety of methods and it's really coordinated. It's not done in a haphazard way. Many times the skills that people use in behavior management build upon each other. So we want to have a good foundation first of strengthening that relationship and then adding many of these other behavior management strategies on top of that. Okay. So, when we're talking, of, so first we want to build that relationship between caregivers and, the, and their children. So that's the foundation. We know if caregivers have a better relationship with their children, children are more likely to be compliant and less oppositional and have less behavior difficulties. So, and this is kind of a summary slide that I'll talk about in a little bit more, but parent-child interaction skills. We want to make sure parents, they increase the child's positive behaviors. We want to make sure that when parents are interacting with their children, that the children are more likely to be engaging in better social skills, sharing, turn taking, using gentle hands. We also want the interaction between parents and children to improve the child's mood, their self esteem, and really that relationship. I have so many caregivers that come to me and say that they don't really enjoy spending time with the child anymore. Whether this is a kid that's in foster care for a while, the foster parent is having difficulty with the child the biological parent, maybe there's a different caregiver like a grandparent. But many times they just say for the kids experience behavior problems, it's not fun to interact with them and every interaction is either neutral or negative. So we want to make sure we have more positive interaction between parents and their children. And also we want to make sure that parents really improve their monitoring of their child's behavior. So many caregivers fail to respond to a child doing something positive with a reinforcement strategy such as praise. Many caregivers feel like they praise at a high level, but many times they're not praising at a high enough level. And many times not at a level that kind of counteracts some of the criticism or the negative things happening from a caregiver. So we want parents and caregivers to increase their monitoring and supervision of their children and respond in ways that are more effective and rewarding for their children. And those ineffective parent-child interaction strategy, uh, skills are really just the opposite. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Messman? Yes. Uh, your, your audio is just going in and out a little bit, and so I know that's kind of uh, some, some technical stuff, but just um, try to talk into the microphone if, if you're able to. Uh, I'm trying to, and the slides don't like to go forward or backwards very well. Okay, I, I can uh, do that. If you just want to tell me when to advance slides, I'll be happy to take take that over. Wonderful, advance slides. <laughs> there we go, thank you. So just the opposite of these positive child interaction skills, we have the opposite, so they're ineffective ones. Many times, ineffective parent-child interactions involve 
Um, parents that are kind of giving unnecessary commands to children, and I think a key word there is unnecessary. Many times parents need to give commands to their children. It's just sometimes they're giving unnecessary commands. Um, many times they're um, interacting with their kids in really um, kind of ineffective ways, such as they're asking a lot of questions instead of listening to children. They're accidentally responding to negative attention-seeking behaviors that children are doing. Uh, many times parents are trying to correct their child's behavior, but sometimes they're actually uh, responding in a way that's giving too much attention to it and therefore actually increasing the likelihood that the behavior will actually continue again in the future. And also, once again, they're failing to notice and positively respond to some positive behaviors that the child or child is actually doing. Next slide, please. So I think this is a really great cartoon. I remember growing up reading Dennis the Menace in the newspaper. And Dennis the Menace here, he's in a timeout. He's in the corner. Um, he must have done something really bad. And he says at the bottom, my problem is that I'm always good when nobody is watching. And I think that many times is the hallmark for a child who has behavioral difficulties when there's ineffective kind of parent-child interactions or ineffective strategies that the caregivers are using. Clearly, Dennis the Menace does get in trouble because he does have some misbehavior, but I bet he does some really positive and good things as well that sometimes are not being paid attention to. So we want to make sure caregivers are paying attention to Dennis's positive behaviors too. Uh, next slide, please. So this is more specific information of what does effective parent-child interactions look like. So I highlighted five words there, praising, reflecting, imitating, describing, and enjoyment. So when parents are interacting with their children, we really want those five words to be happening. And if we take the first letter of each of those words, the P, the R, the I, the D, and the E, we call those, it spells the word pride. So we often talk to caregivers about using pride skills when interacting with their children. And many times these are probably more appropriate for kind of younger children to kind of younger school age children as well. So when you're having caregivers spending time with their kids and playing along with them, you want them to praise their children. So once again, we want them to notice the child's good behavior. And for praise, we want parents to be giving labeled praises versus unlabeled praises. And unlabeled praise is something like, thank you. That is good. That's a compliment the caregiver is giving the child, but it's not very specific. So the child doesn't really know why they're being thanked. So instead, we want caregivers to give what we call labeled praises. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for using your indoor voice. Thank you for using gentle hands when playing with the train. Those are labeled praises. Now it's much more clear to the child what he or she is doing, so then the child can be more likely to do that again in the future. So what labeled praises? We also want caregivers to reflect what the child is saying. And this is kind of paraphrasing or repeating it back to the child. And like I said, for kids, like they like hearing the caregivers say things right back to them. If the kid is saying, oh, they're coloring maybe, and the kid says the crayon is red, and the parent says, you're right, the crayon is red, that's really good for young kids to hear those things. It once again helps the young child know that the parent and caregiver is really listening to them and paying attention and shows approval for their behavior. So kind of summarizing or paraphrasing back to the child. Also shows you're interested in the child when you're playing together by imitating the child's play. So if the kid is pushing a train down the track, you know what, the caregiver is gonna do the same thing. They're also, also pushing a train down the track. If the kid is coloring with some crayons on paper, the caregiver does the same thing. Really imitating the child's play really helps um, show approval for the child's behavior. And also it helps the caregiver make sure they're playing at the correct developmental level with the child. We also have caregivers describe what young kids are doing as well. So you're just saying out loud what the child is doing. And it's very similar to being a sports announcer. And we tell caregivers that all the time. When you are watching sports, there's an announcer or a commentator that's honestly describing. He's simply saying what the sports player is doing. 
It's the same thing with a caregiver or a parent with a child. They're describing what the child is doing. You're coloring the picture red. You um, picked up the crayon off the floor. You added a block to the tower. You're describing. It helps organize that the child's playing keeps them on task. And then finally, we want a lot of enjoyment. Enjoyment adds warmth in the play, and it helps the child know that the caregiver really enjoys playing along with them. And that just really enhances all the other skills as well. And enjoyment is also kind of what they're saying, but also it's nonverbal. It's their facial expressions, a pat on the back, a hug, a high five. All of those things are great to see. Um, next slide, please. So those are some effective parent-child interactions. Also, another aspect of effective parent-child interactions is helping caregivers know when to ignore a child's behavior. Ignoring is an underutilized strategy, but it's really, really powerful and effective. Ignoring works best for children when they're doing kind of minor disruptive behaviors, not behaviors that are highly aggressive or destructive, but behaviors where kids are kind of like, whining or sassing, or maybe talking a little bit too loudly, or maybe like mildly aggressive with play. It's really best to withhold your attention, ignore that completely, because this is many times when parents want to correct their child's behavior, let them know that they should be doing something different, but actually what they're doing at the same time is they're accidentally reinforcing the child's behavior because they're giving them attention. And many times it's this attention that then maintains the child's behavior, and then the behavior continues to occur, even though the parent is trying to correct the child. So often ignoring is you're not giving in, giving the child what they want. Many times parents say, well, I need to correct the child's behavior because they're going to continue to do it. But many times with these kind of minor disruptive behaviors, they actually want attention from the caregiver. So by ignoring, you're not giving the, care, the child what they actually want. And if you're consistently ignoring, over time, the behavior will decrease. And so let's say if the child is kind of talking in a loud voice, if the caregiver ignores that, ignores that eventually the child will talk in a more appropriate voice. And you want the caregiver then to immediately say to the child, thank you for using your indoor voice. Oh, they start talking loudly again, ignore that. Once they do the positive behavior, once again, talking on, with a nicer indoor voice, you immediately give a labeled praise for that. So it's showing the child they do not get attention for these mildly disruptive negative behaviors. They only get attention for the positive behavior, the indoor voice. Or if you're ignoring the sad thing, you're paying attention to when they use a nice tone of voice. So you always want to kind of ignore the negative. If it's mildly disruptive, pay attention to the positive. Immediately give a big labeled praise when you see the child doing the positive behavior. So Ignoring can be a really effective strategy as well. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. So another aspect of um, effective child-directed interactions with children is there's some things you want to avoid doing as well. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about how you set this up at home. We're going to talk about setting up kind of special time between parents and caregivers. But in this kind of special time where you're practicing these skills, you also want parents to avoid giving commands because commands are really um, teaching, uh, they're, they're being overly directive. So you want parents to practice being non-directive when they don't need to be directive because many times parents give so many commands to the children. We want children to have a time where they're not getting commands. And once again, this helps parents avoid over, um, avoid the overuse of unnecessary commands. So commands are just things that suggest um, a child should do something, um, such as put the block on the tower, please color the, um, use the red crayon, pick up the crayon that fell on the floor, please put the toys away. Those are all direct commands. And once again, we're going to practice using these at a specific time of the day, realizing that other times throughout the day, of course, you need to give commands. If you're walking on the sidewalk, you need to give a command for please hold my hand or please wait for the light to change. Of course, you need to give commands at other times throughout the day. We're just talking about a selective specific times of the day when you're practicing. So you're having the caregiver practice being non-directive. Also, you want to practice have parents of that um, practice avoiding giving questions because um, giving questions really is an indirect way to communicate between a parent and a caregiver. 
And also questions can inter really interrupt play and are, are unpleasant as well. And this was actually really hard for caregivers to change as well. And to have really good, positive, effective parent-child directed interactions with their children, you want them to avoid giving questions as much as they can. Of course, at other times throughout the day, you need to ask questions sometimes. If you came into the room and a sibling is crying, you need to ask what happened. And also you want parents to um, practice, um, avoid using some of these negative or critical statements. No, don't, stop, not, and quit many times are uh, critical statements and you want parents to avoid giving critical statements as much as they can because also this can um, prevent accidental rewarding of some of those negative attention seeking behaviors as well. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. So we want to use pride skills, but we want parents to also avoid those commands, those questions, and those critical statements when they are um, spending time with their kids. So those are the skills we want them to practice. So the best way to set up a time to practice is that you have caregivers spend five minutes every day with their child in a one-on-one -on -one situation. And what you do is you set up three different types of toys to play with. You want toys that are really creative, such as construction toys, play sets, a baby doll, something like that. You want to have toys that really um, that don't have any rules, such as board games, or even toys that really discourage conversation, like um, watching television or video games, or even reading books, are not the best um, times to practice these kind of pride skills. Um, we want parents to follow the child's lead, either playing along the child or next to the child. And we want to use those pride skills, praise, reflect, imitate, describe, and show enjoyment. And once again, it's a one-on-one -on -one time between the caregiver and the child because you're trying to really establish a strong relationship in that dyad between the caregiver and child. And also you want them to set up a distraction-free environment. The TV's not on, the cell phone ringer is off. You're in a private place where people aren't gonna be walking in and out of the room. And it's, I also really encourage caregivers to set up special time at the same time every day as much as they can. Because once again, these are kids who've experienced trauma. And trauma, by definition, is unplanned and unpredictable. So we want special time to be something that is predictable. It happens at the same time every day. So this helps create routine and structures for kids who've experienced trauma, which is also really beneficial and helpful for them. And also, special time isn't a reward. It's not something that gets taken away for misbehavior. Special time between a caregiver and child happens every day regardless of the child behavior. And I tell caregivers when children have really difficult, challenging behaviors, that's actually the day that they're probably most in need of that special time because they need to know that their caregiver loves them and wants to spend time with them regardless of their behavior. It's not dependent on their behavior. It's because they love them. And that special time really helps regulate the child and helps develop that relationship to reduce some of those behavioral difficulties. So let's go on to the next slide. So that's a way to kind of set up how to practice these effective parent-child interactions, use of those pride skills, and avoiding of those commands, questions, and critical statements. So that, those, that really works best with kind of young children and younger school-age kids. So let's talk about what do effective parent-teen interactions look like. Those can look similarly in some aspects, but also um, maybe a little different. Also, so you want caregivers to make positive comments or more neutral descriptive comments to teenagers as well. Of course, kids, teenagers are really good at detecting where their caregivers or their parents are kind of being phony or putting on a show. So you really want it to be genuine interactions between the caregiver and the child. Um, also, this is a great time for caregivers to be really reflective listeners, to avoid asking lots of questions and really just listening to their adolescent talk to them about things happening in their life. And it doesn't have to necessarily be about big issues happening at school or with friends, but just listening to the adolescent tell them about a new video game or music that they enjoy listening to or what their plans are for the weekend. This is a great opportunity to be a really reflective listener and helping parents really listen instead of being overly kind of controlling or giving commands or giving too many questions. Once again, um, uh, questions are and instructions are often too directive when you're trying to build this relationship. Asking an occasional question to a teenager isn't going to be a bad thing, though. Um, and we want to avoid those corrections um, as much as possible in those kind of one on one time with a caregiver is spending with a teenager. Once again, ignore some of the minor disruptive behaviors that may occur. 
And for little kids, we often talk, or younger school age kids, we talk about five minutes. For adolescents, they could do 10, maybe up to 15 minutes. We want to have a one on one time. And many times we want caregivers that just join their adolescent in an activity that they're actually already doing. So if the teenager is outside shooting basketball, um, the, the adult just kind of joins them. Or if a kid is playing a video game, they can play a video game with them and kind of try to talk with them a little bit. Maybe they're playing on the computer, maybe they're on social media doing something, listening to music. You just want the caregiver to find the teen already doing an activity and join them. And like I said, many adolescents will first kind of be like, what are you doing? It may feel a little strange because they're maybe not used to their caregiver or their parent doing that. But by consistently doing that over time, it's just a way that you're checking in with a teenager about how they're doing, listening to them. And like I said, it doesn't always have to be about really big, important subjects or topics. It's about just doing something enjoyable with the adolescent as well. And many times adolescents are surprised to learn that their caregivers or parents are interested in learning about a video game or who um, someone, a new musical artist is. It's amazing that when I have parents talk about like, I had no idea my child was interested in these different activities. And it's because they really weren't spending much time with them together. So those are some ways to help create effective parent kind of adolescent or teenage interaction. Okay, let's go on to our next slide. So these are ways that once again, we're building relationships between caregivers and their children. Another really good proactive strategy. So once again, you're helping caregivers and parents learn strategies and skills to use to elicit more positive res responding from their child. So another one of these proactive strategies is helping caregivers give effective commands. And there's like seven different aspects of how to give us an effective command. One aspect of effective command giving is making your commands direct. It does not imply a choice. So I talk to caregivers about, you're not asking the child to do something, you're telling them to do something. You're not asking, can you help me pick up? You're saying something like, please start to pick up the toys. Because can you help me pick up the adolescent or child can say no, because you're asking them a question. So instead of asking a question, make it direct. Please start to pick up the toys. Please put the crayons back in the box. In the box. And you want to make sure that it's clear that the child is the one that's supposed to do it. Because often caregivers say, let's clean up the toys. What they actually mean is they want the child to do it, but they said let's. Let's means that the caregiver is going to help. So it needs to be really clear in a direct command, the caregiver is telling the child what to do, not asking. And also it's clear that the child is the one that is supposed to do or the activity or follow the command, not someone else or several people. So we want commands to be direct. Also, we want commands to be what we call positively, positively stated. By that means we're telling the child what to do versus what not to do. And this can be really challenging for caregivers. Often when parents see children running, they say, stop running. Stop running is telling a child what not to do. What the caregiver actually wants the child to do is walk. So the caregiver needs to say, please walk, or please use your walking feet. Instead of saying, stop touching that, say, please keep your hands to yourself. Please hold my hand. Please put your hands in your pocket. So, because I've had kids before, when a caregiver has said, stop running, the child has started to skip. And the, care, the kid's like, I'm not running. And technically, you're right, the kid is not running. So you want it to be really clear, what does the caregiver want the child to do? I'm still waiting for the day where I see a caregiver say to a child, stop running, and I see the kids start to crawl or even roll along the floor. I thought that's going to happen someday, but that has not happened yet. But I would hope that that does not happen because we want the caregiver to say, please walk. So it's really clear what they want to happen. Also commands one at a time, particularly if we were talking about young children or younger school age kids, we need commands to happen one at a time. I have many times have caregivers tell a four year old, go upstairs, brush your teeth, change your pajamas, and then sit on the bed until I come upstairs. Once again, this child is not going to be able to do that many commands in a row. Even if they were able to start to brush their teeth, they're not going to be able to remember what the other commands are. So giving commands one at a time makes it really clear to the child what they need to do. And it's really clear to the caregiver that compliance has occurred. 
because if the caregiver gives a multi-step command that has like three steps to it, but the caregiver, but the child does one or two steps, did they comply? They kind of partially did, but not fully. So if you give one command at a time, it's really clear when compliance has occurred. And also we want commands to be specific. So often we have caregivers say things like behave, watch out, settle down, be careful. So those are direct commands, but it is not clear at all to the child what they need to do. If a child is standing on the chair and the parent says, watch out, what does the caregiver or parent want the child to actually do? They want them to stand on the floor. So I tell caregivers to say, please stand on the floor. Please put your feet on the floor, something like that. But you want them to be really, really clear um, and specific rather than vague. Okay, next slide. So we want direct, positively stated, one at a time and specific. We also want commands to be developmentally appropriate. So we need to make sure that the command the caregiver is giving fits the age or developmental level of the child. And that's clear because sometimes a kid who is chronologically, let's say eight years old, developmentally may be younger, more like a five or a six year old. So it's really important for caregivers to give commands that are developmentally appropriate. So you need to make sure that it's within the child's skill set. Because if they can't understand the command, they're not going to be able to follow the command and do it. And then the caregiver thinks of the child as being oppositional or non-compliant versus the child just doesn't even understand the command because it's not appropriate for their developmental age. So once again, we need to make sure commands are developmentally appropriate. We also want to make sure that commands are given in a very polite and respectful manner. So this teaches children then to obey polite and respectful commands. Often what happens is the caregiver gives a command, the child non-complies, and then the caregiver starts to give the command louder, the child still doesn't comply, eventually the child is yelling, and now the kid eventually complies. And what the parent has learned is that they just need to yell for their child to do something, and the child has also learned, I can just ignore until the parent yells. And we don't want that to happen. So we want caregivers to, every time they give a command, they give it in a polite and respectful tone of voice. It's much more neutral. Starting the command with please. Please hand me the crayon. Please push the train down the track. Please uh, hold my hand while we're walking on the sidewalk. That is polite and respectful. Because we want to make sure that children respond to those commands versus waiting for the caregiver to yell. And also we want commands to only occur when necessary. We often, when I've done home visits actually with families, I've seen parents and caregivers give so many commands to their children when they have kind of behavioral issues, because they think if they give lots of commands, then the child's going to comply. The issue is sometimes they give too many commands, and especially commands that are unnecessary, that actually increases the likelihood the commands are not going to be followed. So sometimes in the moment, if it's just easier for the caregiver to do it themselves, Many times they should just do it themselves than have the child do it. Um, and also makes children, it's much easier to follow through with praise or other discipline strategies if they're not overusing of commands. So helping caregivers follow the, those seven rules of effective command giving, it increases the likelihood that the child is actually going to be compliant because they have given a really good effective command. So those proactive strategies, building that relationship, having really effective child parent or caregiver child interactions across the age range, builds that relationship, makes it stronger, helps the child be more compliant, have less behavioral difficulties, and also learning how to give effective commands. Those are really two great proactive strategies that things our caregivers are doing that hopefully will elicit positive or good responses from the child. So next we're going to be moving on to some of these reactive strategies. So let's go on to the next slide. So what are strategies that caregivers can do that these are things that happen after the child's behavior has already occurred. So proactive is what caregivers do before the child's behavior. Reactive are strategies they use after the child's behavior. So we have reward and punishment. So rewards increase the likelihood that the behavior is either going to stay the same or increase in the future given the same context. 
and a punishment is something that's going to decrease behaviors over time or if they're using um, selective attention they're ignoring some of these behaviors they're going to go down because the child actually wants attention so reward is something we're going to do to try to do to increase positive behaviors Punishment are things that we're going to do to try to decrease some of the negative behaviors that children do. Okay, so let's go on to the next slide. And first, we're going to talk about some of these reinforcement strategies and what does reinforcement mean, and then also talk about some different factors that affect the um, effectiveness of some of these strategies. So first, what is reinforcement? Reinforcement is a process in which a behavior is increased by the consequence that follows it. So you want to have reinforcement for positive desired behaviors. You want your child to be more gentle in their play. You want to use reinforcement strategies. If you want them to um, share more, turn taking, social skills, all of those are reinforcement strategies. Um, also, even things like uh, following commands or following house rules or chores, reinforcement strategies. So some different factors that impact reinforcement. You want to make sure that the reinforcement strategy that you use occurs immediately after the behavior occurs. So, for example, let's say the caregiver is using ice cream, let's say as a reinforcement. I love ice cream, so I use that as reinforcement on my own life sometimes, but we'll just use ice cream. And let's say the caregiver gives the child ice cream after dinner and says, you're getting ice cream because you did such a great job getting ready for school in the morning. That's not really an effective use of reinforcement because the reinforcer is happening a long time after the behavior occurs, so in the morning. So we need to make sure that the reinforcement strategy or uh, reinforcement, um, the reinforcer happens immediately after the behavior occurs. The closer in times it occurs, the stronger connection that there will be. Also with reinforcement, you wanna make sure it happens every time the behavior occurs. And this is particularly true, true when a child is learning a behavior at the beginning. You want to reinforce them every time. And then over time, you can kind of remove the reinforcer. You want to make sure also the child has little access to the reinforcer. If once again, the reinforcer is, let's say, ice cream, for example, but the child gets ice cream all throughout the day, that's not really an appropriate reinforcer because they get the reinforcer all the time. You want to save the reinforcer uh, for a special time and they don't have access to it at a different time. And you want to make sure that the reinforcer is powerful enough as well. For example, if the kid doesn't actually like ice cream for some kind of crazy reason, which is hard for me to fathom, if they don't like ice cream, they're not going to be motivated by it. So then they're not going to be, it's not really a powerful reinforcer. So one, let's go on to the next slide. So one reinforcement strategy is use of praise. So praise is something that should really be used for daily activities such as compliance with commands or following rules. And once again, we want to have those um, labeled praises. Thank you for sharing with your sister versus just thank you, which is the unlabeled praise. We want praises to be happening for everyday activities. We want them to be labeled. Once again, we want them to immediately happen after the behavior occurs. So right after brother shares the Play-Doh with his sister, you immediately say to the child, thank you for sharing with your sister. Also, um, you want them to be consistently happening. Once again, every time that behavior occurs, you want to give praise. And also not qualified. This is, can be a hard one for caregivers. Many times they say, thank you for sharing with your sister. Why don't you share all the time? Or thank you for sharing with your sister. It'd be really helpful if you shared with your sister all the time, every time you play with her. That now has just undone all the positive that you have done with that label praise. So we want to make sure it's not qualified. It's a label praise. There's no negative aspect to it. And also, you want praise to be having, happening at a much higher level and a stronger intensity than what kind of criticism or corrective feedback occurs. So for every kind of correction, you need to get several praises to kind of counteract that. And your corrections or criticisms are going to be in a neutral tone of voice versus your praise are gonna be more enthusiastic and animated and there's excitement because you want the child to be motivated to work for that positive attention. So you need to make sure your praises occur at a much higher level and intensity than what the kind of criticisms that happen. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. 
So praises are really good for kind of everyday things like compliance with commands and rules. Um, rewards are kind of more tangible things. These are things that kids kind of earn. They can be small prizes or other things like that. But you don't do this for most day-to-day -day situations. These are kind of more likely to be saved for special situations like behavior in public. Maybe at the end of their shopping trip for a good behavior, they get to pick out a candy bar in the aisle. Um, maybe they have earned because they did their, not only their chores, but they did their brother's chores. Now the kid gets to stay up an extra 15 minutes past his bedtime. So once again, these are kind of special situations where rewards can happen and they can provide really additional incentive to stimulate motivation as well. So once again, sometimes parents will wanna do rewards for listening or minding, but really you should be using praise for listening and minding and compliance, whereas rewards are kind of for these non everyday occurrences. Let's talk a little bit more about rewards on the next slide. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about like kind of behavior charts and how behavior charts can be good ways to manage uh, rewards. So like I said, they're a convenient way of managing the rewards. They are visual, because many times you make um, some type of chart and you display it and put it on the fridge. It's visual, it's less abstract, it's easy to see progress over time. A behavior chart should be used part of an overall behavior management plan. So you're also going to use praise for those everyday activities. You're going to give those effective commands. You're going to have caregivers spend special time with their kids. And maybe there's going to be other punishment strategies, such as timeout or something like that. And you can use these charts or stickers can be used with children as young as four years of age as well. Okay, so let's go on to the next slide, talk a little bit more about behavior charts quickly. So with behavior charts, we want to make sure first you define the behavior that you want to increase. Once again, reinforcement is about increasing the positive behaviors that the child is doing. So you need to make sure that the behavior is really specific, it's clear, it's simple, and positively stated. For example, maybe um, you're going to reward the child for brushing their teeth for 30 seconds following um, breakfast. So that's a very specific, clear, simple, positively stated reward. Um, so you make the chart, you display it somewhere in the fridge. We'll talk about in a few slides what kind of sample charts can look like. And you also wanna create a menu of rewards as well. You wanna have daily rewards, which are kids that things that kids can earn on a daily basis, such as a small toy. Maybe they can stay at 10 minutes past their bedtime. They can pick out the dessert that they want for dinner. Maybe it's a special game they get to play with their parent or extra computer time. It doesn't always have to be things that people buy. It can also be some of these things of the extra staying up later or extra time on the TV or computer. So you have daily rewards and then you also make weekly rewards. And these are bigger rewards that kids can earn as well, like an outing with a parent to the park or to the zoo. Um, depending on the age of the kid, they can go to a friend's night, a friend's house overnight, or a friend can come to their house. They could rent a video game or purchase a movie on some streaming service, or maybe there's some type of allowance that occurs. But you create a menu of rewards of daily rewards and weekly rewards. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. Um, setting up an appropriate goal is really, really important though. So if the child does not start earning daily rewards within the first few days, the program's not gonna work because they're like, why am I trying to do all these behaviors? because I actually never get the prize or get to have the, um, the dessert or never get to sit at, stay up later. So you wanna make sure the child feels success as early as possible. And you can use the shaping process. So you set the initial goal slightly above the number of times the behavior already occurs. So for example, if the child um, brushes their teeth, they're supposed to do it in the morning and the evening, um, and they are maybe first doing it in the morning, um, you want to have it um, kind of like twice a day then. And then if you want them to brush in the morning, noon, and evening, then there's three times a day. So first you start maybe the first goal is two times a day. Then when they successfully do it two times a day, then you move it up to three times a day. So you do it slightly above the number of times the child already currently does it, and then you increase it over time. Setting a reasonable goal makes it easier for the child to once again experience success. And if the goal is set too high, the too high, the child is not going to 
follow through and then the program isn't going to work very well. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. So you want to explain to the child the different target behaviors, what they're going to be working on. You're going to keep track of the chart. You're going to explain this to the child. How are you going to manage the chart? Talk about the daily and weekly rewards. You want to make sure they stay up to date and rotate it so they're not the same ones every single day because if they're the same ones, that's not going to be very enjoyable to the child. Um, once again, the child is the one that gets to choose what the rewards are. And also frequently remind the child about the behavior in the chart as well throughout the day so that they kind of remind it of what they're working towards as well. So after you develop it, obviously you need to have a meeting with the child and explain these different factors as well. Okay, let's, let's move on. And then you want to give the rewards when the different behaviors actually occur as well. So sometimes it can be uh, a star in the box that day for they get it. Uh, and also you want to give this reward on the chart immediately following the behavior. So maybe if it's making their bed in the morning, you immediately give them the star or on the chart or you put a sticker there right after they make the bed. It is important to pair the reward with praise as well, because the goal is not to use this behavior chart indefinitely, because if you're pairing it with praise over time, you're going to have the caregiver use the chart less and less. But if they paired it with praise, hopefully the child now is motivated to continue to do the behavior because of the labeled praise that they're that they are receiving for it. So it's important to pair the praise with the actual tangible reward or the star or the sticker. And also for kids, if they don't do that um, behavior, then they actually just do not, there's no consequence for not um, doing that behavior. There's no consequence for um, on the star chart. It's not like they get things taken away with that. Okay, let's move on. And then you just gradually adjust the goal over time, like I said. you. Maybe for the weekly goal, maybe they have to get four stickers that week. Once they get four, then they get the weekly reward. The next week, they have to get five stickers. Once they're consistently doing that, they move it up to six, then move it up to seven. So you gradually increase the criterion to receive the daily reward and the weekly reward as well. And once the behavior is at the desired level, you can just continue the chart or substitute a new behavior, or you can start the chart altogether. And then the next slide actually kind of gives an example of some of these uh, behavior charts. Okay, and just for the sake of time, because I want to make sure I can answer questions at the end, we're going to skip the next few slides that are kind of about behavior chart mistakes. But once again, this is a recorded presentation, so you, and this will be on the YouTube channel, so you can always look at some of these other slides as well. So some of the behavior chart mistakes on the next two slides we're going to skip over. And also kind of there's a point system as well that can be used for kids kind of the age eight and older. And once again, it's developed the same way. And once again, there's weekly rewards and daily rewards. And instead, kids earn points that they can kind of save up the points and then they can kind of buy or purchase some of these other daily or weekly rewards. So those are some of the kind of behavior chart systems that you can use with star charts, sticker charts, and point systems as well, kind of for kids kind of ages eight there's where some of those point systems can start to work because points are more abstract than like stickers or stars. Okay, and then we're going to um, finally talk a little bit about punishment strategies. Once again, this is a reactive parental parenting strategy. So it's something you do after the child's behavior and you want to decrease the behavior. So here we want to decrease negative or undesired behaviors. And some of the same factors that happen with reinforcement are appropriate for punishment as well. Uh, the punisher needs to come right after the behavior occurs. It's given every time. And you want to make sure that the, pun the punisher is powerful enough. For example, if you're going to be taking away a child's video games for noncompliance, but they still have access to all their computer games, um, that's maybe not an appropriate pun powerful punisher because you're removing, yes, the Xbox games, but they still have access to the video games elsewhere. So you want to make sure that the punisher is powerful enough. Okay, let's go on to the next slide, some considerations about punishment. So punishment does not necessarily teach a child what they should be doing. So just because some of the negative behaviors may stop, it doesn't necessarily automatically mean that positive behaviors are going to happen in its replacement. 
For example, let's say a child gets punished. Maybe he gets the timeout every single time he hits his sister. He may not necessarily automatically be more gentle or kind with his sister, though. So maybe he no longer hits his sister, but he's not maybe sharing more. So just because a negative behavior has decreased, it's not necessarily that you're going to see a positive behavior that's automatically going to increase in its place. Also, punishment can really disrupt a child's mood. It's a really negative interaction. Um, it can lead to escape or avoidance. So young kids don't like to fess up and say, yes, I've done something wrong when they know they're going to be punished. So for example, in my family growing up, I had three siblings. So there was four of us. And let's say somebody broke something in the house and my mom and dad said, who broke it? All four of us would say, none of us did it. And then one of my parents would say, I guess the fifth child did it then. So there was always some extra sibling that did all the misbehavior because we all lied about it because we wanted to avoid punishment. And that's what happens many times when there's lots of punishment, you're going to see an increase in lying because they want to escape the avoid it. They want to escape the punishment or avoid it altogether. Punishment strategy also can be overused because sometimes it actually works. When children maybe, um, uh, if they spank their child and it actually reduces the child's behavior, the parent is now more likely to continue to spank again in the future because it's reinforcing their behavior, but maybe punishing the child's behavior. So now the child's less likely to do it, but the parent now is more likely to do it then. So that's some of the issue as well as punishment sometimes negatively reinforces a parent's behavior and use of punishment. Punishment usually works best when it's just a little and you have a lot of rewards and reinforcement that go along with it. Short, mild punishment is best, but it needs to fit the developmental age of the child as well. And we're gonna talk a little bit about timeout, which is the next slide. And timeout is, can be a really effective punishment strategy. Basically, a child loses access to all positive reinforcement for a brief period of time after the following of the problematic behavior. Time out is the most effective for kids between the ages of kind of like two and a half all the way through the ages of seven, maybe up to, up to the age eight. A time out is not nearly as effective for a, a, a school age kid that's in fourth, fifth, sixth grade or a teenager. Time out doesn't tend to work as well for them. So with a timeout, you really need to think about why are they getting a timeout? What is the function of the child's behavior? So if a kid doesn't want to eat dinner and then they go to timeout, that's actually not the best use of the timeout because they actually want to escape eating or sitting at the table. So now they no longer have to do that. Or if they're getting out of bed at night and you give them a timeout, that's exactly what they want to do. They don't want to be in bed. So you have to think about what is the function of the behavior. If the kids are doing the behavior to escape or avoid something, a timeout usually is not very effective in those situations. So many times timeouts are better for kids that are breaking a rule, such as maybe hitting a sibling or swearing or lying. Those are things that kids can get a timeout for. Obviously with a timeout, we often think about timeout chair. You got to think about practicality, the size of the timeout chair. Where does the chair actually go in the house? For kids, you want to make sure it's a sturdy adult sized chair uh, where they have limited access to positive reinforcement. So it's not like right in front of the television or they're looking out the window and they're looking at um, some animals outside or kids playing. You want to make sure that they're in a place where there's nothing reinforcing them. Also, uh, many times you have to think about that. You always have to think about the length of the timeout. Many protocols talk about kind of one minute for every age of the child. Some protocols talk about a five-year-old gets a five-minute timeout, a six-year-old gets a six-minute timeout. More of the programs that I use, particularly like parent-child interaction therapy, which is for kids two through the age of six, they just do a solid three minutes for their timeout, regardless of the child's age, and that, as long as they fall in that age range, because three minutes is long enough for the child to be a timeout. You also have to think about what happens if the kid gets out of the timeout. What are you going to do then? And some protocols, particularly like PCIT, parent-child interaction therapy, they talk about the use of like a backup room, such as now maybe the kid needs to go to their bedroom or a spare bedroom, and they need to be there for a specified amount of time, usually just like a minute. And once that minute is over, then they have to go back and sit in the timeout chair. 
if they get out of the timeout chair, they need to go back to that backup room and be in there again for a minute. So that backup room is the punishment for getting off the chair. And eventually the child learns that they need to just stay on the chair for the length of the timeout. But many times you go back and forth from getting off the chair, going to the backup room, then back to the chair and back and forth each time. And then also when the kid is in timeout, you need to make sure that caregivers are ignoring all the child's behavior as long as they're not unsafe, dangerous behavior. But if the kid is screaming or yelling or tantruming or saying mean things, you want the caregiver to actually avoid all of those things because by the caregiver saying things like, you're being really mean, that's not very nice, you shouldn't say those things, it's actually reinforcing the child's behavior. So when a kid is in timeout, the caregiver needs to ignore everything the child is saying or doing as long as they're staying in the chair and they're not doing anything that is dangerous in those situations. And timeout begins as soon as they get on the chair. It doesn't have to, many caregivers say, well, I'm not gonna start timeout until they're actually quiet. It doesn't really matter as long as they're in that timeout chair, as long as they're not doing anything unsafe, just ignore all of that. And that timeout continues for those minutes. And timeout can be done for kids who have experienced trauma as well. Uh, timeout is not re-traumatizing. There's been a lot of research for programs like PCIT where timeout is an important part of it that has been found that it helps reduce kids' um, traumatic stress symptoms when it's done in conjunction with a lot of the positive parent-child and um, effective interactions. So punishment shouldn't be just done by itself. When timeout is part of a larger behavior management system, it can be really powerful in reducing some of the negative behaviors. And like I said, it is appropriate for kids who have timeout, even if they have experienced trauma as well. And I think I'm actually gonna end right there. There are a few more slides that talk about response costs. So kind of removing privileges when negative behaviors occur. Many times age eight older, that's really appropriate for. And there's a few other slides about positive pop practice and restitution. But I just want to make sure, since we only have a few minutes left, that if there's some questions, I can answer some of the questions as well, knowing that you guys have access to these slides in a different way as well. Okay, so what questions do you guys have? Uh, Chad, are there any kind of themes with the questions that you saw? Thanks. Yeah, we, we had a couple of um, questions come in, so I'm just kind of scrolling up to those. Sure. Um, so, <clears throat> one, one person asked earlier, um, what, what if, you know, on a bad day, the child refuses to have special time with the caregiver? Should the caregiver insist or just offer and let the child choose? And I guess that kind of makes me think is, how do you sort of set that stage? And is there a choice? Like, how, how do you, how does that look like? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think that at first, that may be a little, if you're not used to having a caregiver do it with a child, it may be a little, feel a little strange or different at first, but children quickly get used to this routine and really like special time because the caregiver is giving them basically undivided attention and people like attention and you're getting praise and they're saying what you're saying and they're describing what you're doing and they're really enthusiastic and animated and enjoying it. Caregivers do a great job with this and kids really enjoy it. So if for some reason the kid doesn't want to play with the child, if they are playing, the caregiver can maybe play nearby or play next to them. And then every once in a while, pepper in one of those pride skills, the praising, reflecting, imitating, describe, and enjoy, and then kind of try to integrate their play with the kid. But playing alongside them is just fine and trying to do it. So sometimes you may see this a little bit happen, but really kids, you don't actually see that a whole lot kids really, really enjoy this special time. So there's a way you can kind of get started to see if the kid will continue. But many times if they don't want to play, sometimes that maybe um, they want a different choice of toys. Um, they want a different, maybe it's not the correct time of the day. If they're really irritable and tired, what time of the day is this? Are they really tired? Um, and so maybe it's trying to find a different time of the day or some different toys as well. But honestly, we don't see that a whole lot but I'd get the kids started, but if for some reason they didn't want to play that day, not the end of the world, but there's a lot of things that caregivers can do to try to continue, but make sure that play continues to happen. Okay. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the CEU because I know we're just at time. Um, the code for today's CEU is 2204. Um, the code again is 2204. Um, just write that down because you'll need that um, to 
receive a CEU if, if, if you're interested in that. So after we end today's webinar, I will send um, an email shortly afterwards um, that'll uh, direct you to enter that code. So, it, and if you happen to be watching with the group, um, if you are just, you know, whoever the person signed in on, please just feel free to forward that to your group members. Um, so I'm just going to leave this slide up here for folks um, that need it, but just jot this code down um, and save it. Um, so another, maybe a last kind of um, question for you, Dr. Messman, is um, parents, uh, follow through is sometimes not super great when implementing behavior um, management plans, kind of um, uh, words of encouragement or um, some things that you found helpful to, you know, have the parents kind of keep up with their, with, with, with the management plan. <clears throat> yeah, so we like things to be as predictable, consistent, and make sure parents have the correct follow through as well. And that is important. So that's why I talked about at the beginning, consistency. So every time this happens, the parent follows through with what the plan is. So it's really important to be talking about what is the plan when specific behaviors occur. So if this is, you're working on the kid um, who's being really aggressive with a sibling. So what is the plan? Every time the child hits the sibling, sibling, what's the plan? So they get a timeout. You're talking through what timeout looks like. You're talking about all the different ways that timeouts can go wrong and troubleshooting and problem solving all of that and making sure that you need to follow through every step of the way. Because if you stop timeout too early or you're tired and you don't want to do anymore, what the child has learned then is that you're not actually going to follow through with everything. And kids are really quick to know, oh, I can do this now because I know I'm not going to get in trouble because my parent doesn't put me in timeout for when I hit my sibling, or I, do, I just need to have a long enough tantrum and they're gonna give up. So the beginning is hard. I'm not gonna lie, it is hard at the beginning to change a child's behavior. Just imagine in your own life, anytime you've ever tried to change any of your own behaviors, those can be tricky, it can be hard, and it's challenging at the beginning, but you do need to have that follow through. And I tell caregivers a lot with timeout, you just need to last a little, a little bit longer. You need to just outlast them a little bit longer than what they're doing. And they don't even know how long you would have gone with it. It just needs to be a little bit longer than them. The first time is always the most challenging many times with timeout. Um, but the, long, the more consistently you do it, kids actually learn quite quickly. Okay, I don't, every time I get out of the chair, I just go right back into the chair. Eventually they learn, I just need to stay in the chair. Or every time I hit my sibling, I learn, I go to timeout, so I'm not going to hit my sibling as much. One thing that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to automatically be kind and sharing, it just means they're not hitting it anymore. So it can be challenging at the beginning, but the more you're consistent you are, the more that they follow through, the higher likelihood that the behaviors will change as well. Um, but yeah, the kid isn't used to timeout, or he's not used to a uh, caregiver ignoring them when they're talking loudly. So they may escalate the behaviors initially, but caregivers really need to follow through and stick with it. And that, like I said, consistency and follow through are some of the most challenging aspects of all of this, but are so critical to success though. All right, well, um, thank, thank you very much, Dr. Messman, for this uh, informative webinar. And um, thank, thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you everyone, this was great. Okay, so the code is 2204. I will send an email out um, within the hour, so shortly. So just be looking for that and um, jot down that code so you can get your CEU if that's something you're interested in. So take care, everyone.